when the couple finally collapsed onto the sweat-soaked sheets of their bed. Julie's mind was in turmoil. Her body was exhausted. Her spirit was empty. I love you, Ramon said. You're everything to me. Yes, you too, she whispered as sleep crept over her. In other words, everything was exactly the same as every evening. The next morning, Julia was distracted, her mind constantly returning to a random thought that had crossed her mind the night before. Is this really what I want? She tried to brush it off. After all, it wasn't unusual for extraneous thoughts to wander through her mind as she lay in bed with Ramon, her walls crumbling under the inexorable force of his love and intimacy. Some of them were ordinary daily thoughts, like, do I need to fill up? Or, did I forget to pay my water bill? But the sensations tended to push ordinary thoughts out of my head. Soon, the thoughts running through her head were more from the realm of cosmic consciousness, such as, do we exist outside of thoughts? Or, Ramon decides what to do next, or do I tell him in my head? Our last night. Is this really what I want? It was a serious question, and she resented the insistence with which it was bouncing around in her head. Being an assistant manager at the Alfred E. Michon Museum of Contemporary Art Gift Shop wasn't all that difficult, and she often complained that she barely used her bachelor's degree in art management. But on this particular day, she was grateful that her job was no more demanding. However, her absent-mindedness caught the attention of her colleagues, and by the time lunch came around, her friend Carolyn Murray was desperate to find out what was going on. Okay, lay it out, she said to Julie after they sat down at their usual table. What are you talking about? There's something on your mind, Carolyn rummaged through her salad for a mushroom. What's happening? I have no idea what you're talking about, Julie muttered, looking away. Come on, Julie, do you think I was born yesterday? Carolyn grinned. You haven't been yourself all morning. Everyone noticed this. You dialed the wrong numbers, staring into space. Have you ever wondered why Darren put you on his consultation list? Crap. Yes, you can't fool anyone. So come on, honey, what's up? This is Ramon. Carolyn laughed. Of course, of course. What is he doing wrong? Nothing. In fact, everything is exactly like that. Julia sighed and rolled her eyes. It's just, have you ever looked back and wondered if you made the right decisions? Every day, Carolyn put her hand on top of Julie's. Do you think that you married him in vain? She smiled encouragingly. Honey, we all sometimes look back and wonder what would have happened if, what if I married that hot guy I dated in college? What if I had zigzagged when I had the opportunity? Damn it, that's why I'm still single. There were too many doubts, and I couldn't settle on any of the options. There was never a person who completed all the items on the checklist. My problem is a little different, Julia shrugged. Although, I'm just thinking about the guys in college. Ramon isn't as good as your college boys? Julia laughed. Oh, no. Ramon is much better than anyone I dated in college. Better than anyone I've ever had. She shook her head. Oh, my God, those college guys were terrible. It was like I was the one giving them lessons. Ramon turns my world upside down. Sounds tempting. Is it so? The smile disappeared from Julia's face. That's the point. Your world is in shock. Do you always want this? What are you talking about? Julia looked around the cafeteria. They were late for lunch, and there was only one other person in the room, a sloppy-looking guy sitting at a single top table reading a book. She looked back at Carolyn. So here's the thing. Ramon is amazing. I mean, seriously, I think this man might be some kind of sexual expert. Carolyn raised an eyebrow. I still don't see the problem. Every night when I'm with Ramon, it seems to me that he turns my world upside down. It's like he's turning me inside out. I fall asleep feeling completely satisfied and, more of air, completely exhausted. I still don't understand why this is bad. Well, think about it. Imagine getting this every night. I'm starting to hate you. Julia closed her eyes, trying to find the right words. Imagine experiencing world-changing, mind-blowing pleasure over and over again. Imagine that you are experiencing one wave of pleasure after another, 
and each of them knocks you off your feet. You forget your name, who you are. Carolyn Zerzala. Well, now I know for sure that I hate you. I know, I know, it sounds great, Julie shrugged. Maybe too good to be true. But really think about it, Caro. Think about how you lose your sense of self, forget who you are, feel like your personal boundaries are blurring, and you become completely one with someone else. I... I've never had anything like this. This sounds amazing. It is amazing. But it's also scary. It's like I'm disappearing. I dissolve. It's like I'm not Julie anymore. It's not me. Carolyn shook her head. Okay, let's say I understand. I haven't had this happen, but let's assume. They both laughed. That still doesn't explain why you think about your college boyfriends. Well, that's the point. I mean, they were terrible. Julia laughed. I was sometimes lucky to get something pleasant from them before they turned over and fell asleep. She froze with a wry smile on her face, suddenly realizing what her thoughts were spinning around. Sometimes I kind of miss it, she whispered. I don't understand you. Julia looked again at the guy on the other side of the room. Thinning blonde hair, a little overweight, khaki pants, white shirt, brown cardigan. His book was Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Yes. It doesn't sound very great, but it was enough, you know. Sex with them was kind of fun and kind of hot, but not too much, not too exciting. We had sex, I went to bed, and the next day, I returned to normal life. Sometimes it didn't even ruin my hair. She grinned. But with Ramon, it's so much, every time. It leaves me broken and exhausted. It usually takes most of the day to get back on your feet. Then, just as I come to my senses, we make a mess in the bedroom again. I lose myself again, and the whole process starts all over again. Carolyn's eyes widened. This sounds incredible. But that's the point. Julia tilted her head to the side. What if I don't want my world to be shaken, Caro? What if I just want those regular, easy nights of sex in college? No unkempt hair, no jumbled emotions. God, I really hate you. Carolyn tried to laugh, but it didn't sound convincing. But why not just tell Ramon what you want? What should I tell my husband that I want boring sex? Carolyn snorted. Well, maybe not exactly. Maybe just tell him that you feel that such passionate sex is interfering with your emotional relationship and that you want something more intimate, a little more restrained. Do you think he will agree? I don't know. A man going for boring sex? This is crazy, Julie, but it might work. They grinned. Just tell him that you want to communicate more. He will probably be in seventh heaven, especially when you let him know you want to try it immediately. Julie took another look at the guy across the room. Very normal. I will try. I still hate you. Seriously. Ramon returned home to the spicy smell of chicken and wine, hot chorizo and hot chili. Basque chicken was a dish that Julie made every time she wanted something. He grinned as he took off his jacket and boots. Julie, I'm home. I am in the kitchen. Julie felt self-conscious, but she hid it by being almost Disney-level cheerful. She carefully prepared for the conversation. After all, criticizing a man for the way he makes love is very dangerous. Probably even more so with a person like Ramon, who puts so much of himself, his soul, into this. She wasn't sure what to do next. Before, she really had nothing to complain about. Dinner provided cover for most of the evening, and the familiar routine of compliments and conversation Passing dishes and meaningful glances while sipping wine carried her through the meal. But when dinner was finished, Ramon leaned back in his chair, wiped his mouth, and gave Julia that withering look that seemed to have become second nature to him. Damn Latino lover. Even when he's not trying, he warms up the room. Okay, what's the matter? He finally said, leaning back in his chair. What are you talking about? Ramon snorted. Basque chicken. Flirty dress, fresh makeup. You make the best impression. All the signs are there. Do I need to start inspecting the car for dents, or are you going to tell me what's on your mind? Julie pouted sexily, but when she saw that he wasn't going to give up, she sighed. Well, actually, it's about... 
our sex life. Yes? Well, it's, it's so, it's so, hmm, intense. Julia looked up and caught the expression on his face. Not that it was bad, she exclaimed. Sex with you is the best thing I've ever had. The point is, well, intensity. Sometimes I think we get lost in this. Ramon's expression darkened. So you want to stop having sex? No, no. Julia let out a light laugh. In no case. I want to have sex. I love our sex. Ramon sighed. So what do you want, Julie? Tonight I want to try to take it slow. Gently. Not our usual intense sex that drives me wild. I want to try to connect in a different way. Ramon's shoulders sagged with relief. And that's all? God, you scared me. Honestly, it sounds tempting. He grinned. Do you mind trying this tonight? Really? You do not mind, do you? I was worried. Julie, Ramon interrupted her. Think about it. You're asking me to have sex with the woman I love. How can I say no? The sex that night was exactly what Julie had asked for. Slow, romantic, intimate. No sizzling bedtime conversations or fireworks that characterized much of her relationship with Ramon. He spent his time gently, tasting it, enjoying it. And as he slowly enjoyed her, cradling her in his strong arms and looking into her soul with his deep, dark brown eyes, she felt every part of her soul being drawn into the man, drawn into the love they shared. She felt like she was being torn apart again, and like every other night, she no longer felt like a lonely creature. She was part of something bigger, larger, but less personal. She closed her eyes tightly. It was terrible. Julia was at lunch with Carolyn again. Once again, she tried to understand the anxiety she felt towards Ramon. Couldn't he have gone slower? No, worse. He was perfect. He was in no hurry. Julia smiled mirthlessly. It was painful. Feel how much he enjoyed me. Stop it. Seriously. Carolyn looked up at her. If you finish this sentence, I don't know if we can be friends. It was perfect, Caro. I had nothing to complain about. He couldn't have done anything better. And it was... different. Most nights I end up physically broken. I know. I saw the look on your face, Carolyn said. Lucky bitch. Last night I was just... emotionally destroyed. It was as if he had looked so deep inside me. It was as if I saw the world through his eyes, and he saw it through mine. Julia looked around the room. A polite guy was sitting at another table. Today he was reading Love Story and was wearing a different cardigan. Same glasses, same thinning brown hair. She shook her head. I didn't know where I was staying. I feel like I'm losing control of myself. You know you describe almost every romance novel I've ever read, right? I know. And the thing is, if anyone had told me this, I would have guessed that she was the happiest girl in the history of the world. I mean, who wouldn't want a man to be that much in love? Julia growled in frustration. That's who I am. I mean, seriously, who complains that the sex is too good? Carolyn rolled her eyes. I ask myself the same question. I just feel like there's nothing left of me. No, I want to remain myself. I need sex that doesn't drive me crazy. She clasped her hands and stared at the man again. He just seemed so normal, so bland. For God's sake, love story? Ramon is like modern art. He is Liechtenstein or Picasso. He is from Guernica, juicy, intensive, absorbing. She laughed, and I whine because I want something from the Hudson Valley School. Or heck, maybe Bob Ross? something that looks good over the sofa and goes well with beige. You have a masterpiece, and you want one of those paintings they sell at the starving artist shows at Hilton Airport. You're killing me, Julie, right? Not that I can complain about anything else. Ramon owns two gyms, buys me a new car every couple of years, and pays for our house. Hell, I couldn't afford this job if I had to support myself. She sighed. Ramon shows his love in every possible way for a man. He is perfection itself. Carolyn rolled her eyes. You are poor and unhappy. What are you going to do? God, I have no idea. When Julie got home from work, it was raining. 
and her car wouldn't start. She was about to call an Uber when there was a knock on the window. Looking through the foggy glass, she saw a man from the cafeteria holding a black umbrella. She opened the door slightly. Um, yeah? Hello? He smiled uncertainly at her. Problems with the car? Yes, it won't start. She looked him up and down, his rain-stained glasses and khaki trench coat. Did I see you in the cafeteria? Hey, Harold. Harold Layton. He adjusted his umbrella and held out his hand for her to shake. It was sticky, but she figured it was probably because of the rain. At least that's what she hoped. I work as an administrator in the accounting department. Julia Garcia, I work in a gift shop. I know, I, uh, uh, saw you there. He blushed. So, uh, do you need any help? I was just about to call an Uber. My car is over there, he said. I'd be glad to give you a ride. Julia had never seen him this close. Average facial features, average height. A little plump, but he wore it well. Affectionate, like a harmless landscape. Ideal for hanging above a sofa. Of course, uh, Harold. Thank you. Just give me a second. She quickly texted Carolyn and grabbed her bag. Harold's Camry was parked two spaces away, and they walked under his umbrella. The machine told Julie something about Harold. He was tidy, but not obsessively tidy. His ashtray was a bit of a mess, and his rug could use a vacuum. Still, this is several notches above what she expected from a bachelor. In terms of music, he seemed to have a penchant for universal, relaxed, lounge, and easy listening. The hardest thing he included seemed to be Jason Mraz. They talked about the weather, the city, and work. Polite conversation, but strangely calming. It didn't ask too much of her. He was also gentle and careful when he accidentally slid his hand over hers. A moment later, she not so accidentally squeezed his hand. So this is where you live, said Harold, driving up to Julie's house. This is a good area, she said. Polite small talk, soft and soothing. I live a few blocks from here on the Crescent. We are neighbors. Almost, he answered. Anyway, I, um, see you at work. Yes, see you. Thanks for the ride. There was that slightly awkward moment when the ways in which they could say goodbye loomed as a social faux pas in the making. She then decided to shake his hand, and he shook it warmly and dryly in return. Not sticky anymore, she thought. She then got out of the car, entered the house, and found herself back in Ramon's loving arms. A week later, Harold approached her in the cafeteria, just like in some high school movie. He invited Julie to ride with him, listing his reasons as only an accountant could. He only lived a couple of blocks away, so it would be convenient for both of them. Plus, he noted, the issue of refueling and parking was simplified. And, not coincidentally, it would be nice to have someone to talk to on the way to and from work. She quickly agreed, although his reasoning wasn't all that convincing. After all, gas only cost a couple of bucks a week, and besides, she often stopped at the grocery store on her way home from work, so commuting with Harold would probably be a challenge. It wasn't that convenient. But then there was this whole company-on-the-road story. Her thoughts kept returning to the way he touched her hand. His touch caused no fireworks, no flames, no electricity. Her eyes did not widen, her breathing did not quicken. But it was easy and comforting, soothing. There were no jumbled emotions or confusing energy. Ramon was worried about Harold until he met him. Not that Harold gave Ramon much to like or dislike. In truth, the guy was definitely cornstarch in the gravy, potato in the stew. Reassured, Ramon gave his blessing and praised Julia for finding a way to save some money and time. Riding around in Harold's car before and after work, she learned about the intricacies of the museum's accounting department and the intricate politics of Harold's neighborhood, and the dubious wonders of modern, easy-listening music. She learned most about Harold, and much of what she learned reinforced her previous impressions. To put it mildly, Harold was boring. It was delicious. Two boring parents who were married for 35 years. Twelve boring years at a boring public school, followed by four boring years at a mid-tier public university where he studied accounting, which was boring. 
He spent Wednesday nights playing Dungeons and Dragons, served food at the Water Street Soup Kitchen on Saturdays, and attended First United Methodist Church on Sunday mornings. He loved The Office and could quote every episode word for word. That's not surprising, Carolyn said when Julie reported this to her. He's the real Toby. So there was Harold, 30 years old, never married, thinning hair and slightly overweight, wire-rimmed glasses, and a penchant for clothing colors ranging from brown to beige. As far as Julia could tell, the most controversial thing he had ever done was touch her hand that day in his car. Over the next months, they slowly moved from touching hands to shaking hands, from kissing on the cheek to dry kissing on the lips. They made it a rule never to eat together in the staff cafeteria, but once a week they left the building to eat at the deli down the street. Three months after Julie's first ride in Harold's car, she went to his church and met his parents. Julia assumed that Harold had told his family and friends that he and Ramon were having problems. And it was true although Ramon didn't know it yet. Julie had amazing sex with her husband, but sometimes her mind began to wander even before everything was revealed. And as Ramon continued to discuss his day with her, she found herself increasingly talking about her work at the museum in somewhat vague general terms. The first time Julie had sex with Harold, Ramon was out of town. He was at a convention. She went to Harold's house, ostensibly to look at his collection of Pez dispensers, and they ended up in his bed. It was everything she'd dreamed of, uninteresting, unimaginative, and definitely by the book. Soft, timid kisses that led to awkward undressing. Then they lay side by side, both staring at the ceiling, lost in their individual worlds. It was bliss. Julie didn't check, but she was sure that her hair wasn't even disheveled. Returning from the conference, Ramon was beyond excited full of ideas to improve and expand his gyms. Julia tried to concentrate, but her thoughts kept returning to Harold. She perked up when Ramon mentioned that he was going to another regional conference. He said it would only last a couple of nights. That time, Harold came to her house. Both nights, they slept on the bed in the guest room. Julia made little effort to hide the growing distance in their marriage and was not surprised when Ramon ran into her and Harold at the grocery store during lunch a couple of weeks later. Watching her future ex-husband, Julia once again remembered the magnificent creature she had married and, apparently, was soon going to divorce. Ramon did not rage, did not fly into a rage. In fact, if it weren't for the tense line of his jaw, she might not have even realized how much pain he was in. He calmly walked over to their table, sat down and nodded at her right hand, which was intertwined with Harold's left. How long? Julia lowered her eyes, unable to meet Ramon's gaze, her slender hand and Harold's soft, plump fingers intertwined. Three months, she whispered. From the day he took me home. How long have you been cheating? She shuddered. About a month. This, this is great, Ramon said. His voice was firm, almost emotionless, although Julia could hear the roughness underneath. And when were you going to tell me? Julia shuddered. She hated it. No matter how calm Ramon was, she still felt the anger and pain emanating from him. They were hidden, just out of sight. Soon? When? When I will know for sure, she said. Harold was silent, but Julia felt the warm, confident softness of his hand. He squeezed it lightly. This, this is great, Ramon repeated. Was I your plan B or was he? Don't answer that, he said when Julia looked up at him. I, I don't want to know. I never wanted to hurt you, Julia whispered. I'm sure this will bring me a lot of comfort in the years to come. How do you know? You, you've never been very attentive, but these past few months it's been like living with a mannequin. When I returned from the conference, I was so excited. I had so many ideas about how to build a business, get us to a place where we could talk seriously about children. He looked piercingly at her. You didn't hear a word I said. I think then I understood everything. Why didn't you say anything? There is a huge difference between thinking you know something and being willing to confront it. 
I decided that I would give you a chance to see if I was right or wrong, so I connected the house to the network. Microphones, small video cameras. So you saw us? Ramon snorted. Yes and no. The cameras are activated by movement. When I saw the video, I thought they were broken. You see, they kept turning on and off. Then I realized that you were moving so slowly that they couldn't catch the movement. He smiled darkly. Damn it, Jules. I'm surprised there weren't buzzards sitting at the end of the bed. Julia blushed. Ramon, I... Don't worry, Julie. I understand. Maybe you wanted something more relaxed. Maybe you just wanted something that wasn't me. He sighed and stood up. And now you will get it. Ramon. Julie, I said don't bother. Ramon barked. He fell silent for a moment. And Julia saw him catch his breath, holding back his emotions. I'll try to be fair, but if you fight me, everything will come out. Be smart and sign the papers when they arrive. He turned to Harold. As for you, you have no idea how much I want to tear you apart. Harold turned pale. But I'm not interested in going to jail or closing my business to pay it off. Besides, scars would just make you look more interesting. It would be more cruel to leave you as you are. He smiled, a cold, empty smile that Julia had to turn away from. However, if I were you, I would stay away from the dark alleys for a while. I'm trying to be smart, but right now, I'm just I really wanting to pay back. Ramon filed a statement of irreconcilable differences and proposed dividing the spouse's property by 50% without paying alimony. He opened his first gym before they got married, and it was part of their prenuptial agreement. Julie's lawyer advised her to fight it. She began to have some concerns about whether she could live on her salary, so she took his advice. Ramon withdrew the petition, then refiled it, proposing the same separation, but citing adultery. The video was eventually played in court. In fact, it ended up being replayed three times, as the judge stated that he wasn't entirely sure that anything actually happened, given that the action on camera was barely noticeable and the camera kept cutting off. Ultimately, however, he agreed that adultery had occurred, although the lack of cheerfulness and involvement led the judge to wonder whether one or both participants had been drugged with prohibited substances. Julie testified that this was not the case, that both she and Harold had sex of their own free will, and that both enjoyed the incredibly slow, unathletic pace of sex they were having. By the end of his testimony, Ramon was crying. Although looking at him closely, Julia realized that these were tears of laughter. It was humiliating. If there's anything more shameful than having your bedroom behavior criticized by a 70-year-old judge, it's that Julia's 53-year-old mother, after watching the incriminating video, asked her if she should see a therapist. I mean, after what you told me about Ramona, well, honey, it's just... Why? Julia felt herself blushing. Mother. Did he beat you, honey? No. Treated you badly? Threatened you? No, Mom. Did he ignore you? Was he more interested in the business than in you? Mom, he was an ideal husband. Then why, Julie? Why in the name of all that is holy did you refuse to marry him and tie your star to Harold? I mean, it doesn't mean he's a bad guy. It's just the way it is. Well, there's just nothing like that there. Julia didn't know what to say. How do you explain to your mother that Ramon was simply unbearable and that he wanted her to be unbearably too, that they were too connected, too in love? She sighed. What can I say, Mom? The heart wants what the heart wants. The heart needs to see a psychiatrist or an ophthalmologist, Julie's mom muttered. Despite the best efforts of Julia's lawyer, Ramon's videotapes more or less failed her case. Given the absence of children and the fact that she had a paid job, the judge said that Julia was fortunate to receive an equal distribution of the marital property. He also noted that although he had no legal basis to force her to see a psychiatrist, he strongly advised her to see a professional. Julie and Ramon's accounts weren't all that full, as he insisted on plowing profits back into the gyms and only paid himself a modest salary. However, she received a check for a decent amount from the sale of the house, and was able to pay off most of her student loans. She lived at home for several months and then moved in with Harold. A year after their divorce, they were married in his parents' church, and a year after that, 
she gave birth to Harold Layton Jr. Karen, Julie, and Rob followed before Harold Sr. decided to have a vasectomy. Julie quit her job at the museum when she became pregnant with Harold Jr., but returned part-time after Rob started school. As before, she and Harold went to work together, and as before, she listened to a lot of Jason Mraz and Michael Buble. Carolyn never stopped working at the museum, and when Julie returned, Carolyn was director of merchandising, a position that took her several rungs higher in the ranks than her old friend. However, sometimes they would have lunch together in Carolyn's office or cafeteria. Julia tried to ignore the nameplate on Caro's desk, Carolyn Garcia. After their divorce, Ramon threw himself into his business and, with almost the same energy, into dating. For about a year, it seemed like Julie could barely walk. Into a room without hearing her ex-husband's name mentioned in hushed conversations. She didn't know if he was deliberately targeting the women who worked at the museum and attended Harold's church, or if he was simply courting every available woman in town. Despite everything, she endured whispers, random women fanning their faces, strange looks when she entered a room or took Harold's hand. Carolyn finally intervened. Julia wondered if she was simply biding her time, allowing Ramon to get Julie out of his system before locking him away. They never talked about it, but Julie remembered her friend's words. It seemed that Ramon matched Caro on all counts, and Julie couldn't argue with the fact that her ex-husband was truly a masterpiece. Carolyn never talked about Ramona, but his success was hard to ignore, especially when his face appeared on a billboard Julie passed on her way to work. He had five gyms in the area and was looking to expand into a neighboring state. And Julie sometimes saw Ramon and Carolyn in the gossip pages, at a gallery opening or a charity auction. She even caught a glimpse of them at the museum gala. Caro in a stunning cobalt blue dress and Ramona in a chic tuxedo that was clearly tailored, especially for him. And when he set Carolyn down on the dance floor and whispered in her ear, Julie felt something inside her crumble. Meanwhile, she kept an eye on the waiters, checked invitations at the entrance, and tried her best not to feel jealous. Sometimes sitting in Harold's car and listening to easy listening covers and the softest soft rock, Julie thought about her life with Ramon and the masterpiece she left behind. And sometimes while setting the dinner table or arranging dishes for her family, she felt, well, not regret, but maybe a little hunger, the feeling that life could be something more. And then she thought about her family, her children and her life, which were completely under her control. She looked at her husband's serene face and told herself that she was happy with the man she came home to every evening. Most of the time, she even believed it. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.